So, so colleagues, welcome. And my name is Joshua Kastli. You know, it's a real privilege to do this session with you uh, today. Self-determination is probably the most written about element of international law in the history of international law. And that's because it really lies at the heart of what is a sovereign state and how power by a government can really be exercised over a particular piece of territory. So it touches on a number of different areas and probably it's the ideal cross-cutting topic in public international law. So Elvira said we have till 11.30. I'm conscious that you might, may have questions. Uh, I'm happy to be interrupted at any stage by any question that you might have. I'm going to try and keep my presentation to maybe around uh, 40 minutes, I think, uh, maximum. Uh, I have a one-page sheet, which I think, Elvira, you're going to share, which essentially just gives you a bit of a structure. Uh, there's six things, really, I wanted to, to run you through. And if you work the maths out, that's uh, around six minutes per topic. So it's going to be relatively superficial, um, but the idea really is to get you to start thinking about this topic. So the six things I want to talk to you a little bit about, I want to start first with a brief history of self-determination. You might think this is where all academics start, but that's for a reason, because essentially this norm in public international law has been through so many different inflections in history that various people have tried to use it to justify various different things. So I wanna give you something of a history of, of, of self-determination. There are seven elements there that I want to, to touch on. Then I want to take you very briefly through five documents, and I'm not really going to deal with the text, but in the one page sheet that accompanies this class, which sets out the, the framework, all of the five documents I have are, are hyperlinked. So you've got, you can click on the hyperlink. Elvira, maybe better to share it because then they can click on the, on the hyperlink themselves if they want to, um, whichever you prefer. Then I want to talk a little bit at the, about the legal concepts at stake. And I divide that into two sections. I want to talk about who are the people, which is a fundamental question in public international law. And then I want to talk about the grounds for self-determination, which give you legal cases and, and legal basis for how self-determination is either claimed or denied or granted. And I want to finish really with some practical examples. I want to talk about how self-determination has been achieved. I want to talk about successful, and I, you'll see I've put that in, in parentheses, because these are successful to the extent to which power has been transferred. Whether you think they are transferred to the right people, whether you think that terminates the self-determination question, that's an open one. But I also want to finish with what I'm calling, in, again in parentheses, failures of self-determination. And I only use that word not in, a, in a, not in a judgmental sense, but in the sense that the power that has been claimed has not yet been transferred. So they may well be successes, depending on how you see it. So I hope that much is clear enough. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to pause for a moment or two to address any of those that you might have or to build any questions you may have into my presentation. So I'm waiting for what I'm, what I'm deeming a respectable time before continuing. Uh, not as yet, thank so, you. Well, I don't have any questions, but maybe during the presentation, I would definitely get some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, so please do put them in the chat. I can, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not working from notes, so I'm, I'm working from the same sheet you are. So I'm happy to, to, to address your questions if you put them in the chat as they come up. So let's start then with the, with the brief, brief history. And you can see I've put down seven, what I think of as waves of self-determination. The idea, and you can go further back than, than these seven. I start at the French and American Revolution in the late 1700s, mainly because that's where the Enlightenment era and Western colonized, Western public international law defines that as a starting point. There are antecedents to this. And if you read some of the other materials that, that you may come across, there are real questions about the Eurocentricity of, of public international law. But when this subject is typically taught, American and French revolutions are often considered to be the first stepping point, mainly because those were very public declarations by which a people, an entity, made a statement about the kind of government they had. So in the French Revolution, the argument really was, and actually that's a photograph in the background of uh, where the French Revolution 
took place. In that particular argument, the people, so to speak, rose up and they said, never more. We want, we want equality, we want fraternity, we want liberty, and that's really going to be key, giving us this idea that really the people were somehow important to governance. At, before that stage, and of course post that stage, because we still have autocratic rule, there was this idea that, well, I'm the king, I can do whatever I want to, and if you don't like it, tough. So this idea is quite important in the context of the French Revolution, followed up very quickly by the American Declaration, where you have essentially people from Europe who went over to the United States of America, as it then became, and declared their independence from Britain. And they made this unilateral declaration saying, we are no longer subject to Europe. We are going to create our own entity. We are going to have our own state. So th those were the early antecedents to it. And we're talking about late 1700s followed relatively quickly by the, the, the so-called offspring of the Spanish and Portuguese who had colonized South America following similar kind of patterns. Let me just back up there. And if you, if you go back two or three centuries even before that, what you see is Europe starting to spread its tentacles and starting to claim areas around. A key element, by the way, in the acquisition of territory in public international law is that any territory that you acquire should have been terra nullius, blank territory, unoccupied territory. So already the process by which European powers mainly had begun to take over other parts of the world, declaring them terra nullius went against that principle. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not only Europeans who did this, the Ottoman Empire spread, the Chinese Empire spread, the question around Tibet very much is whether or not China legitimately acquired or didn't acquire that region. So this is not about saying that Europe was the only empire that spread, but this is about saying that in the annals of public international law, European expansion violated what was really a European idea of public international law, which comes from Hugo Grotius and the, the, the big scholars in public international law, which is that the only territory that you can occupy is territory that's terra nullius, blank territory. Anyway, that happens. And in, in between 1810 and 1825, the, the Spanish and Portuguese offspring in Latin America, and Portuguese because of Brazil, the other states were Spanish, uh, came under Spanish colonization, begin to make this argument that they have a right to self-determination. And that as a virtue of that right, they can break their ties off from Madrid and Lisboa and create their own states. And they used this idea of self-determination. So it became a first real practical example of it. And of course, a key element there is nobody asked the indigenous peoples what they wanted. And essentially the boundaries that you got initially were boundaries that were drawn in church law, ecclesiastical law, which designated parishes. So those are early elements of it. If you fast forward a little bit more, you see another century later, the, the, the Ottoman Empire, a huge empire that goes all the way across the Middle East into Asia and of course starting from Turkey. And what you get is the Ottoman Empire starts breaking up and the Austro-Hungarian Empire further north starts breaking up. And these questions are asked, you know, how do these entities that were part of an empire get independence? And in the context of that breakup, US President Woodrow Wilson makes a very famous statement where he says that statesmen will henceforth ignore the aspirations of people at their peril. So he's saying, you know what? you need to be able to understand the consent of the government to have a legitimate state. So these are all important staging points that goes ahead. And of course you get the emergence of many states as the Ottoman empire breaks down. And that's also the period of world war one. And that's also the, towards the end of that is the post-war period where you're suddenly beginning to figure out exactly what happens to small entities. And these are still live questions today. The Orland islands, for instance, in, which, is, which is part of Swedish, which is part of Finnish jurisdiction, but is Swedish speaking. The South Tyrol question, which is between Austria and, and Italy, which is a German speaking population that's Italian. So there are all of these little questions on the edge, even in Europe, as to what happens to these. Fast forward a little bit more. Um, you have World War II and the devastation of World War II. And of course, and famously in 1945, the UN Charter is celebrated, and key among those principles is self-determination. You see it in Article 1, you see it in Article 55, talking about this importance of self-determination. And the idea starts growing that it's really only with the consent of the government that a government, a government can be legitimate. And of course, a key element here is, is Lenin pushing the idea that Western European states are dominating 
African and Asian territory and they need to get out. So you have a bit of a geopolitical angle to this as well. But the, the result of all of that is the enshrining of the norm of self-determination very, very high up on the UN agenda and UN decolonization starts in 1945. And by the way, I, I put a, a link into the, into the chat earlier. There's a conversation about 75 years of that particular process. And that's taking place on, on Friday at Princeton University. I'm speaking at it. You can get the link if you're interested in that. It's a whole day session looking at various elements of, of self-determination. So you've got all of these different elements. Now, 1945 to 1992 is significant for public international law as we know it today, because you go from 51 founding states of the UN in 1945 to 194 states today. And most of those states come out of the process of decolonization. So it becomes very high on the, on the list of principles. Post-decolonial self-determination, however, remains. Because the question is, well, if you think Nigeria is a sovereign state, you'd be correct. But of course, what was Nigeria before? And before the arrival of the British, who declared Nigeria to be the oil river as a state and treated it as one element, before that, there were separate kingdoms there. Similarly with India similarly with, with a whole range of other post-colonial entities, where the post-colonial entities start taking shape under colonial rule. So people say, well, what, what about before? If I'm Kashmiri, I don't necessarily want to be part of India. I had my own kingdom. I want to be part of Kashmir, or I might want to be part of Pakistan. So these are questions that are being asked, and we'll come a little bit more to these. There's, of course, the big question about Palestine in the middle of all of that, too. How do you create a state in the middle of a Jewish state, in the middle of a Middle Eastern area that essentially protects and creates a religious identity in the midst of other. Now, there's plenty of good uh, uh, reasons why you should do it, because it's true. There were pogroms that pushed the Jewish community out of the Ottoman lands into other areas. Of course, World War II and the Holocaust created some grounds for it. But does that mean you can reconstruct a state in the Middle East? And who decides what those boundaries should be? And how do you do that? And there are all these discussions about a letter being written by Lord Balfour to suggest that a Jewish state should be possible. And that letter comes to fruition and a Jewish state comes into being. So this is all about lines on maps by people who don't really have a relation to those areas. Big, big, big questions in public international law today. Limited self-determination for indigenous peoples. While we're having all of these people saying, we are a people, we need to have our own state. Indigenous peoples are saying, uh, excuse me, who are you and why exactly are you in my area? We are the original inhabitants of this. We have ancient title to these areas. Why are you coming into my area and claiming my state? And this is not just in places like New Zealand where the ancient Maori, uh, Maori uh, communities have been overtaken by white settlers, Pakia as they call them, uh, or in South Africa where you have South African communities, Southern African communities dominated by the English and the Dutch, the Boers. It's also in other places where you have Adivasis in places like India, ancient peoples who have lived and dwelled in forests who claim correctly that that's their ancestral title, but because nobody drew little picket fences around it and said, oh, this land is my land and that land is yours, somebody else has been able to claim it. So there are all of these big questions that are still there. I want to finish with that section just by saying that what we are probably experiencing now is an emerging tribalism, where you have real questions about the extent to which a state can truly represent the people that it's part of. Big, big questions in that. The movement of peoples has been significant. So there are no longer are we ethnically and homogenous, homogeneously de defined in a particular area. There's been huge mixing of populations. There's been second generation. There's been multiple citizenship. So this idea that you have one allegiance and that allegiance is to your land is a really, really old fashioned concept that doesn't seem to sit with contemporary identities. So I just leave you with that. I'm happy to address any questions you might have on that part so far. Can you talk about second waves? What, what would be a prime example of a, of a second wave dissolution? Yeah, thank you, Betty, Becky. I mean, the, if, you, if you scroll down to the bottom of this particular page, you'll see plenty of second wave examples. So this would be the question of Kashmir saying, uh, yeah, I believe in self-determination, but why should India exercise that on my behalf? I'm not, I'm not Indian, I'm Kashmiri. Or Papua New, uh, West Papua saying, why should Indonesia have exercised self-determination on my behalf? I'm a legitimate people, I should have self-determination. Or the Kurds saying, why are you considering self-determination to have resulted in the states of Syria 
and Lebanon and Iraq and Iran. We are a Kurdish nation. We should have a claim against these states. Is that clarified, yeah. Becky? Yeah, so would Catalan, the Catalan state in, in Spain also be part of that? Sure, yeah, sure. But I would say the Catalan state, uh, with the question with Catalonia and Scotland and many of the state, many of these entities in the more long established developed world, so to speak, um, really fall into my, my 1.7, the emerging tribalism, where you really have these questions of whether these states that you assumed were monolithic really can accommodate multiple identities. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, Carl? No? Okay, so if I may move then to the second part, and this is where you've got the document package, so to speak, of self-determination. And there's five key documents here. There's many, of course, but I mean, these are the five that are, are most regularly cited. I won't click on any of them. I'd encourage you to do that, though. And essentially, what you get is some of the legal authorities that underpin this discussion. The first and most important one, but also one that can be most easily dismissed from our discussion is the Montevideo Convention. And that's really relevant only because it's defining what a state is. And a state as an actor, I think you did this probably last week in your public international law class, a state as, a, as an actor in international law, of course, has those four elements. Uh, and then you can ask the question of whether there's a declaratory element or a constitutive element. But the reason the state is important because that's the so-called holy grail. You know, many movements of self-determination are looking to get recognized as a state in their own right. Not everyone, it should say, but many of them are looking for recognition in their own right. So the Montevideo Convention provides you something of an element of what is a state in public international law. And of course, it's, it's, it's slightly... The context of it is interesting. So the Montevideo Convention really was set up to try and establish, was really driven by the, by the uh, offspring of the Portuguese and the, and the Spanish saying, this territory now in South America is now occupied territory. You cannot have reconquista. You can't colonize me again. Yes, I know there's part of Brazil that actually even the current Brazilian government hasn't been to and Bolsonaro, believe me, is trying to pave it and sell the trees. But there are still parts of, of, um, of there are still parts, especially of Latin America, that have what we would call uncontacted tribes. So how are you saying that these tribes are Brazilian? They don't even know the state of Brazil exists or they choose to ignore it. But the Montevideo Convention was basically saying, look, these boundaries have been drawn. And once you've got those permanent frontiers and a defined population and a government, and once my friends recognize that we can trade with each other, then essentially we are a state and you can't ask any further questions. So that's an important element there. The other two declarations are important. They both took place. They were both passed in the, in the last few days of the year 1960. That's why you have the, the, the XV, the Roman numerals X and V in brackets, because it's the 15th year of the UN. That's how we used to classify documents at that time. And those were really important because they really set out what the UN means by decolonization and what the UN means by self-determination. So in, 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 in resolution 1514, what you really sense is this idea that we need to get rid of alien subjugation. We need to allow and frackle, uh, uh, unshackle communities and let them, let them have their own self-determination and their own future. And that spirit comes out very clearly in that 1514 resolution. But it spans an interesting question, which is referred to as the, as the Belgian hypothesis or the salt water theory, uh, where a bunch of people say, listen, but hang on, what exactly is colonization? And the main people who push this are the Portuguese. And it's interesting because 1960, when you think about the time period, Portugal as a state was not defined as the tiny little bit that you see on the, on the Iberian Peninsula squashed up between Spain and the Bay of Biscay. What you actually see in the Portuguese constitution was that Portugal at the time consisted of that bit that, that exists now, but also Mozambique, Bo uh, uh, Angola, uh, Goa, Daman, Diu, uh, Macau, all of these places were considered to be Portugal with no distinction. So there was metropolitan Portugal and then there was outlying Portugal. So when Portugal was told, oh, you need to decolonize this, said, this is nonsense. I joined the club in 1951 as a sovereign member and you accepted me as a sovereign member. Now you're telling me you want me to cut out parts of my territory. That's nonsense. It goes against my territorial sovereignty. If you look up what is territorial sovereignty in the UN Charter, you'll see it's contained in Article 2.7. And in Article 2.7, and I can more or less quote it verbatim, it says something like, nothing in the present charter will allow the United Nations or any other member state to intervene 
in the domestic jurisdiction of states. There's an exception, by the way, and that's chapter seven, Security Council, but let's leave that out. So essentially, Portugal is saying, hang on. So now you're telling me you don't recognize my state? You're interfering in my domestic jurisdiction, but out. And so a few days later, this conversation takes place and 1541 is passed. And 1541 really uses this argument that there is something called salt water colonization. And that somehow Portugal, because there was salt water between the metropolitan state and the others, the others could be considered a colony. By the way, don't tell that to the Philippines, you know? Uh, don't tell that to Japan, because there are states that obviously are literal states, the states that are consist of many islands, and it doesn't make sense. But I put those documents there to give you a feel for what is that discussion of who is a colonizer. The, the, the other one that becomes important six years later is the International Bill of Rights. So if you have followed your human rights discussion so far, in 1948, the UN gets together and says, we need to really make human rights a, a, an underpinning platform of everything that we're doing. And so, of course, they famously passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, it's a declaration. It doesn't have any teeth. It is not binding. Not at that time. So basically what happens is the process begins under the stewardship of Eleanor Roosevelt. The process begins to try and convert, if you like, or download those aspirations into legally binding principles. And what emerges from that process is the International Bill of Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Apologies for using the short form in the, in the, in the text there. ICCPR and ICESCR, which of course, when you translate them into, into Arabic or, or Mandarin are meaningless, but essentially those two documents become the linchpin and crucial to it, the first right is for them both, the joint article one is self-determination. So the argument really is now we've taken self-determination out of the public international law realm and we've put it as a founding principle of constitutional law, domestic constitutional law, because you're saying, if I'm going to create any of my other rights, I have to first start by making sure I have the right to create them. So self-determination becomes the right of rights, if you like, and that's why it becomes key. But of course, article, article one, talks about self-determination in a more general sense. Lots of rhetoric there about freeing people, people to freely decide their, their future, to determine their economic, social, and cultural rights, all of that. Really, in the human rights world, self-determination has very rarely been addressed in a meaningful way, mainly because it's considered to be political. So how do you, so if you tried to take the, the issue of, of Palestine to the Human Rights Committee, you'd have a tough time because first of all, it would be Israel, you'd be taking the, the, the case, the so-called case too, and, and they would basically say, this is a political question, not a question of law. So you have many of these questions, and by the way, that's also equally true for Russia, and any questions to do with Chechnya or, or India with Kashmir, there's this argument that these are political questions anyway, and this is territorial, this is interference in the domestic jurisdiction of a state. So let's leave that aside. The key element here that most people cite, which makes self-determination super confusing. So don't, if you're confused so far, it may be because I'm explaining it badly, but it also might be because it's really, really confusing. And 2625, the Declaration on the Friendly Relations Between States passed in 1970, adds hugely to the confusion. Because General Assembly 2625 establishes what are often referred to today as the key founding principles of public international law. Uh, self-determination is in there. So you can say, wow, self-determination is a key founding principle of, of law. Therefore, we need to really implement it. Not only is self-determination in 2625, it's also calling on states to exercise their responsibility in ensuring that self-determination takes place. What does that mean? Does that mean that Pakistan can interfere in Kashmir to allow the Kashmiris to have their self-determination? Does that mean that Iran can interfere with the, uh, the Ahwazi Arabs in Iraq to ensure that they have their self-determination? Does that mean that the Kurds in Turkey can interfere with the Kurds in Iraq or actually more the other way around now because the Kurdish state in Northern Iraq is a de facto state almost. Does that mean the Kurdish state in Northern Iraq can interfere to make sure the Kurds in Syria have self-determination? No, of course it doesn't mean that because that's territorial integrity. So you have these two clashes and 2625 brings it up. Self-determination is reified as a key principle in international law, but territorial integrity is also reified 
as being a key principle in international law. And many say, well, that's a direct contradiction. If I am saying I, as the state of India, am the sovereign government of all of the, the, the small states in my jurisdiction, then how can you say that you're going to interfere to talk about Kashmir because Kashmir is an internal issue? And that's where the confusion lies. And these are the kind of the fragmentary bits of public international around that really say one thing about self-determination that's worth remembering. And this is from Steve Ratner, who's a, a quite authoritative um, uh, writer on public international law, who basically describes self-determination as a legal principle that emerges from a political tenet, political idea. And, and this, this idea is not new. I mentioned before um, uh, Woodrow Wilson. When Woodrow Wilson in 1918 made a famous speech at the Atlantic Charter, and he said, you know, all peoples have a right to self-determination. Immediately, his Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, said, but, but that's ridiculous because how do you know who the, how do you know which people have the right to self-determination? You cannot determine who has the right to self-determination until you figure out who the people are. So if you think the people are the Kashmiris, then you can ask them the question, would you like self-determination? Would you like integration into India as you currently have? Would you like free association into India as you maybe don't have, but as let's say the Cook Islands have with New Zealand? Or would you like secession from India to create your independent state? Now, if you could ask that question to Kashmiris, you'd get one answer. But imagine if you asked that question to all Indians, what answer would you get then? Similarly with Northern Ireland. If you say, well, Northern Ireland has a right to self-determination, well, who are the people who decide? Is it going to be the people of the six counties of Northern Ireland? Is it going to be the people of the nine counties that form the, 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 the province of Ulster, which the British divided into six and three to make sure they had a Protestant majority? Should you ask the people of all the 32 counties of Ireland? Or should you ask the people of Britain and Northern Ireland? Or should you ask the people of Britain and Ireland combined? So of course, depending on what question you ask, you'll get different answers. So that's, I want to pause there because the next question immediately is who are the people? Any questions on that part? No? If I may proceed then? All clear, thank you, Faiza. Okay, so if I may proceed then. So the big question swings on exactly that. Who are the people? And many, many, many have um, made claims to being a people. Essentially, in terms of law, the, the answer to the question, who are a people, uh, is, well, it's a colonial people. Uh, the next question, of course, is who are a colonial people? And then you start getting into really difficult areas. And the, the, the short answer is there isn't clarity on who are a people. And you'll see that. Um, yeah, good to see you, Tanya. Uh, you'll see that basically who are a people has been interpreted in many different contexts constantly. And that's where you get to it. If you look at a hierarchy, and there's an article that I think I shared with you, I'll read a PDF which maybe you could share if it's not on the reading list, where I try to address this question in some detail. And I make a distinction between peoples, indigenous peoples, and minorities. And this is where the question lies. So minorities are people who would exist within a state who may be ethnically, religiously, or linguistically, or for other reason, be different from the rest of the population of a state, and they live in a non-dominant position. They, that's one type of a typical example of this would be uh, Muslims in Britain, for instance, who are British nationals, but who are not necessarily in a, in, a, in a hierarchically strong position. Then you have another category, which was basically indigenous peoples. And these are people who are pre-colonial, uh, who had a pre-colonial existence to a particular piece of land or region that was disrupted by the arrival of colonial powers who may not have got the right to govern that land back. And the indigenous peoples are different from, from, from a, a minority in that they may have all the rights that minorities have, but in addition, they have this long-standing claim to the fact that they are the original inhabitants of the land. Colonial peoples then is one step up from that, and this is where it starts getting very arbitrary. Colonial peoples in terms of the annals of public international law in the UN self-determination era have been really identified as those people who are part of usually a European colony, which was then asked or forced to leave. 
So typically a colonial people would be peoples who are in Africa and Asia, not so much Latin America, because of course Latin American colonization, as you saw from my potted history, predates the UND colonization era by, by well, nearly 80 years. So when we think about those peoples, so to speak, those are entities that were left behind. And the key element to this is how did those entities get formed? Let me take you to West Africa. And if you can, if you are on, on Google, just do a Google, Google search map of West Africa. And what you will see are straight line boundaries, beautiful carved, hand carved straight line boundaries. Uh, Mali, Chad, for instance, Niger, Nigeria. All of these are straight line boundaries, Libya, Egypt. And you think, well, how does this make sense? How do these boundaries become straight line boundaries? And the answer is because these essentially, these boundaries were mostly constructed in an era after the scramble of Africa. So the scramble for Africa took place when essentially European, European colonial states raced each other. It's called the scramble because that's what it is. It's rushing in. Scramble to try and get different parts of Africa. The Brits decided to go from Cape Town to Cairo. If you've got that map in front of you or you have a good geographical sense, you'll, mean, you'll know. That means from the southernmost tip to pretty much the northernmost tip. The French decided to go across the, the, the Zaire Congo River. And so basically they, they had one quest. And of course the inevitable happened. They kept meeting on battlefields. European states met each other on battlefields. How was African territory acquired? I mean, I might do a title to territory class with you, in which case I'm happy to give you many stories, but let me take one. Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes was, a, was all I can call him is a, a British cowboy who essentially, who's venerated by the way in Britain, he's got a statue outside Oxford, which is a, is a big source of um, discomfort to many. But Cecil Rhodes was essentially a British entrepreneur is how British history will, will call it. Uh, British cowboy is how I think the rest of the world sees it, who decided that he was going to go out of South Africa and claim the vast territory to the north. He gets to a point where he meets in Matabelele and he meets a Shona king. And in that conversation with the Shona king, he gives the Shona king some cloth and some beads. The Shona king accepts this as a, as a, um, the, the Shona king accepts this as a tribute to him. And the Cecil Rhodes gives him a piece of paper, which the Shona king does something with. As far as Cecil Rhodes is concerned, he has just bought himself all of that land and he then proceeds to call it, I mean, the man was, uh, if anything, at the very least was arrogant. He called it Rhodesia. He named it after himself. So you have these kinds of exercises replicated ad nauseum across Africa. And this is how land was acquired. And that was already a violation, but worse was to follow in that essentially European armies came across each other. So they decided in 1896-97, they decided, you know what, let's resolve this. They, they met in Berlin at the Berlin West Africa conference and they agreed something that you see in a supermarket quite often, the buy one, get 10 free deal. Maybe you don't see those anymore because it's not quite the ripoff. Commercial activity is not quite the ripoff. It used to be. But essentially they said, you know what, forget about these interior struggles. Who cares where Niger ends and where Chad begins? Let's just get a ruler and a pen and let's just draw lines on maps. And then you have this bit, I have that bit. This is not just me saying it. In 1896, Lord Salisbury in the British House of Lords, which is about 20 minutes away from where I sit, stood up and he said, we have been drawing lines on maps where no white foot has ever trod. We have been giving away mountains, rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the impediment of not knowing where these are. This was essentially a deal done between people. So when you talk about who are a colonial people, it's really difficult to conceptualize it because these were arbitrary lines drawn on maps. Anyway, let's leave the Huara people argument and let's look at the grounds for which self-determination has been claimed. And I've put down six grounds there. The typical one is colonial oppression. And this draws on a very old principle from public international law called jus resistenti accessionis, which was basically the idea that if you are oppressed, you have the right to resistance and that right to resistance might involve breaking up the state. It's a very, very old concept. By the way, it's been used also by Hamas. So it's quite, a, it's quite a problematic and quite a controversial principle of public international law, which has not got so much focus today because right to resistance is a hugely dangerous idea to states. And if there's one statement of public international law, you should always remember, international law is not a suicide club for states. 
right? So states have been very concerned about the development of the so-called right to resistance. And it's been used, by the way, by militia groups and terrorists and freedom movements across the world pretty indiscriminately. So you know, there's, some, there's some caution to be exercised with it. But basically, that was the classical. We were part of a colonial rule uh, of Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Belgium, Holland. Uh, we therefore claim our sovereign right to break away from you. That's the principle that was used with Pakistan, with Nigeria, with Indonesia, with uh, Egypt to a certain extent, less so with uh, Libya, with Morocco, with DRC, with, with Uganda, with Kenya, with Mauritius. These were the similar types of principles. We will now break away from, from colonial rule and we will establish our own state because we don't want to be oppressed by you. Classical form. There are still arguments made on the basis of a people. So this is now not saying we are breaking away as Nigeria because Nigeria had existed before. This is where you make an ethnic oriented claim and say, we are peoples who have been peoples of our own right and you want to assert that particular right. And this is typically often made by indigenous peoples where they say, we are the Maori. We want to create our own Maori state. Yes, we will give you equal rights as non-Maori, but essentially we have historically been a state. We've historically existed as a people. By the way, today there are only three groups that have any justification for making that claim. And when I say justification, it's not, I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm saying that other states agree with it. And those three, the clearest, clearest cut example on that one is Palestine, because there's universal acceptance that Palestinians are a people and that actually Palestine not having a state is partly the result of a failure to decolonize accurately. Now, what that state should be is open. You know, should that state include Israel? Should it be just the West Bank? Should it be the Gaza Strip? Those are all other questions linked to it. But there's little contestation globally that Palestinians are a people without a state. And of course, depending on which state you are from, they, are also, they also have a state because you have the Palestinian Authority. So those are, those are key, key questions there. The second most compelling claim in public international law, probably is the claim for Kurdistan. When you look at Kurdistan, you will see that there were promises made in the 1920s, late 1920s, all the way up to 19, mid 1930s, that Kurdistan would be an independent state. The only reason it didn't, didn't become an independent state is because all of a sudden, the Western allied powers realized that if you create a Kurdistan there, you will give Iran a better and stronger claim to the region to dominate. So this was all about political hegemony. And by the way, just for our colleagues in Dubai, Middle East, the phrase Middle East, you know, that comes from 1902, when a US naval captain says to his, his higher ups, by the way, if we want to gain the wealth to India, we need to control the Middle East. Because what is the word Middle East? Middle of whom? Middle East of what? It's a very European dominated understanding of what that region should be. And crucially, as, as many Arab writers will tell you, that it wasn't even that there was interest in the Middle East, they were just interested in a corridor to India. So there was that idea there as well. So these issues all feed into it. So Kurds have always suggested and have good historic basis to claim existence as a people. The third group probably is the Tibetans. And again, at various points in Chinese history, and China is the country with the longest documented history in the world, over 3,000 years of documented history, you will see various points at which Tibet was independent and various points at which Tibet was subjugated. So it's, it's, it's an undulating plane. What is very clear since 1911, Tibet has been a sovereign part of China and the Chinese refused to contemplate the Tibetans as a state. So even though the Tibetans have legitimacy as being nom nominated as a state and many tacitly support it, Chinese opposition means they can't really get recognized as a state. So that's the element there. The remaining ones very quickly, predetermined territorial unit. This is where essentially somebody has decided you are a unit and therefore you become a state. Lots of questions. I mean, Somalia and, and, and Ethiopia come to mind. Ethiopia, for instance, used to, be the, the, used to be Abyssinia, the only state in Africa that never got colonized. And Abyssinia, when you look in ancient books, and if those of you who may have read uh, Islam, your history of Islam, or history of the, uh, even the Christianity and the Bible will hear references to Abyssinia and the, this conversation between Abyssinia and the Phoenicians, which today is, is, uh, is modern Syria. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I won't, yeah. I, I'm gonna try and finish Alvira in the next few minutes. So 
essentially that idea of Abyssinia, Abyssinia had no boundaries. But one part of Abyssinia did get colonized, and it got colonized by Italy in the middle of World War I, World War II, those conversations that took place between the so-called allies and the so-called enemy states. It, Italy took over one part of Abyss Abyssinia and it created a colony out of it. By the way, that is now modern Eritrea. And the, the, this is flabbergasting to many African jurists because they say, so Abyssinia existed for a long time, like we're talking about centuries. Italian rule in, in that part of Ethiopia existed from 1940 to around 1970, 1980, uh, because there was a trusteeship in between. Uh, that land then went back to Ethiopia. Yes, Ethiopia tried to forcibly assimilate it in, and, and that created a resistance movement where you had one of Africa's longest wars, which of course culminated in Eritrea becoming a separate state. But to many, it, it's flabbergasting that essentially one period of time in Abyssinian history, sorry, there's a siren in the background that you may hear. Uh, that's London reality, I'm afraid. But, uh, so the one idea is that one small part of Abyssinian history had such a great impact on the modern state of Ethiopia. So this idea of a predetermined territorial unit is there. Uh, very often, the grounds for creating a state or not creating a state is what I call political will, or I refer to as the friends in high places argument. This is a very good reason why Israel could become a state but Kurdistan couldn't become a state. So politics plays a key role there. The political will of the parties to constitute a state becomes quite key, and the political will of the powerful parties. The reason that I cannot foresee in this period of time Tibet being a state is because of the rise of China. I cannot imagine China deciding to give Tibet statehood, to allow Tibet statehood, if you like. Remember, there's that element by which a state will not necessarily contribute to its own demise. Now, there are, there are good examples where that has happened. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an anniversary of the year when F.W. de Klerk decided to let Nelson Mandela start his long walk to freedom. But those issues are few and far between in history. It's much more normal for a state to hold and grasp and keep, unless there's such a, it's so difficult to maintain it. Uh, and then the last, the, 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 the fifth one then, of my six, if you're following 3.2.5, ability to win a war of independence. Despite what we say in the annals of public international law about not using force, if you look at um, Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, it says states will refrain from using force in their relations. Despite the attempt in 1928 to ban the use of force, the famous Kellogg-Briand Pact, which tried to outlaw the use of war, despite all of that, force has been used in public international law history, it won't surprise you to know, and very often that has been used to devastating consequences. So Bangladesh emerged from what, what used to be the state of Pakistan. Those of you who don't know this, you'll be surprised perhaps and quite alarmed. But Pakistan, in the aftermath of 1947, consisted of two bits. There was the bit that you see, which is Pakistan today, which was referred to as West Pakistan. And there was another bit, which is underneath the arm of India. If you look on the east, if you look at the map of India, it's like India puts an arm around this other territory, the divided state of Bengal, which was first of all called East Bengal and then became Pakistan. In 1971, there was a claim made for self-determination. I can go into, into questions as to why. But what emerged from there was the independent state of Bangladesh. And frankly, they did it because they won the war. And that's just as simple as that. Well, as over in Africa, in the West of Africa, Biafra, who tried to have the same process, failed. So Biafra today is the sovereign part of, of Nigeria. And Bangladesh is not a sovereign part of Pakistan. It's an independent state. The difference between them, one won the war, one lost the war. There is an argument now about remedial self-determination, where essentially a state behaves so badly and commits crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide, all crimes that are proscribed along with the crime of aggression in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and that the state almost loses its right because it's behaved so badly. And there's an argument being made for remedial self-determination. The only way to correct, remedy means correct, the only way to correct this as a matter of self-defense is to come out and become our own state. Kosovo uses that argument, and Kosovo, of course, has declared independence, and depending on, again, which state you are, Kosovo is or isn't a state, depending on your political allegiances, uh, and this idea of remedial self-determination has existed for a while, but it's really problematic because that means who decides what the remedies are. So the Chinese, for instance, it's documented now, have Uyghurs. Uyghurs are Chinese Muslims in the province of Xinjiang. Again, Xinjiang, like Tibet, is an autonomous region in China. 
And there has been a claim for a long time that the Chinese have been perpetrating crimes against humanity and war crimes and ethnic cleansing, not genocide, but all of those others against the Uyghurs. And therefore, the Uyghurs should, and many make this argument, it's called the East Turkestan argument, that the Uyghurs should have self-determination. Obviously, China denies it, but who will decide what is the remedial self-determination? So I pause there. The, the, remaining, the remaining about 10 or 15 minutes I have are just examples of it. But I'll, I'll pause. Actually, let me, just, let me just talk about means, and then I can pause. There's five means there, and you can see that these mirror it. So sometimes self-determination emerges as a consequence of political negotiation. The best example I can think of is uh, South Sudan, uh, Sudan, South Sudan. Essentially, there was a war, of course, but it resulted in a political negotiation and a referendum. Uh, and that, that's, that's actually, that's 4.4. So political negotiations are the processes that may or may not lead to a referendum. A referendum is the actual process by which that self-determination is achieved. Timor-Leste is another example, similar types of processes. Sometimes you have sustained mass political process, the independence movements, for instance, against British rule, uh, the Indian independence movement led by Gandhi, sustained mass political process that somehow leads to the creation of uh, a separate state, sometimes through legal entitlement. I'm thinking here of the Baltic states. When the when this constitution of the Soviet Union was written and the Soviet Union came into being in 1918, 1920, uh, the Baltic states were invited into the union. It was called the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics. And the Baltic states were invited, so to speak. They were coerced, okay? There was lots of pressure put on them. But they were invited in, and their right to self-determination was guaranteed. So when you had Glasnost and Perestroika, and th these might be strange historical footnotes to you, uh, but, you know, this was very, very fundamental to the end of the Cold War, the Baltic states exercised their right, their legal entitlement to self-determination and came out of the Union. And that's how you started the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So there's a legal entitlement there. It can be through a referendum. I mentioned East Timor or, or, or Sudan. And it can also be through a successful mobilization of armed force, unfortunately, the example I gave you of Bangladesh. So I pause there if you have any questions. Any questions so far? Okay, I trust that you can hear me okay and that I'm not going too fast. Apologies if I am. There's quite a lot of ground to cover and I wanna just make sure that I give you um, adequate time to, to respond. Of course, we can have questions at the end as well. So, okay, so with your permission, then I proceed to the last part of what I was going to give you examples. And these are just to take you through a variety of, of situations that currently exist. So I, I've put down for, for number five is successful. And as I explained before, this is not my value judgment of them. It's the fact that there's been a transference of power. Obviously the most successful, so to speak, self-determination is the transfer of power that the UN oversaw from 1945 to 1992, which gave you, which, which took the world from 51 sovereign states to the 194 that exists now. And that's gave you so many different states. I've given you a few staging points there. Nigeria, one of the earliest, Namibia, one of the, late, one of the latest, even though you'd argue the Palestinian question is still pending. Then there's the post-colonial self-determination. These are much more difficult because now the principle of self-determination that has already been used is being claimed again. And how do you react to those ones? And that's quite, that becomes very, very challenging. Because in a sense, if you look at, I mentioned to you before, the joint article one of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. Now that's in a human rights treaty. And in a human rights treaty, and if you haven't studied this already, forgive me for taking you into ground you may be unfamiliar with, but usually when a human rights treaty has been signed and ratified, or usually at signature, states can have, they can append things to it. They can make a declaration. They can interpret a particular provision, or they can make a reservation. And a reservation is the process by which they basically opt out of a provision. So for instance, if we now on this call decided we were going to come up with rules and one of the rules is you have to have your camera on and that was, let's say, rule number three, you could say, look, I want to participate in this, but I really can't have my camera on. So I want to enter a reservation to article three. Or somebody might say, well, I want to have a declaration. So when you say have a camera on, it means you should have a photograph. It doesn't mean you should have a camera on. So these are interpretations. Article one has a reservation from India 
where India basically argues that yes, it totally believes in self-determination, but self-determination, I mean, sorry, India has a declaration and not a reservation. It's important to point that distinction out. And it says, we believe in self-determination, but really the gist of the Indian argument is self-determination, it's a bit like a disposable razor blade. You use it once, you throw it away. So essentially, India has used the right of self-determination, fully believes in it, but nobody else can use that self-determination again because self-determination on behalf of all Indians has already been exercised by the, by the sovereign state of the Republic of India. So that's an argument that's used. And essentially, post-colonial self-determination becomes quite difficult because in all of those examples you've got, Bangladesh 75, Eritrea 1999, Timor-Leste 2000, South Sudan 2010, all of those entities have come out of existing sovereign states through a process by which they have made those existing sovereign states smaller as a consequence because they've lost territory. Bangladesh used to be part of Pakistan. Pakistan now is half the size that it used to be. Uh, Eritrea used to be part of Ethiopia. Ethiopia was, had nine provinces. With Eritrea, they tried to make it the 10th province. Eritrea has come out. Now Ethiopia has nine provinces. Timor-Leste used to be part of Indonesia. Timor-Leste is no longer part. It's an independent state. So Indonesia now is, is smaller as a consequence. And South Sudan used to be, of course, Sudan. And so you now have this Arab Republic of Sudan in the north and you have South Sudan in the south. So there has always been a contestation and an impact of territorial sovereignty. My third situation is quite different because this is in no way linked to colonization in the same sense that we understand it. The dissolution of the US USSR, and I, I already gave you the example of how that started. That started, well, it started with, with Mikhail Gorbachev and Glasnost, if you want. Uh, and I would argue it started actually with the aftermath of the, the Chernobyl disaster, but that's a, a story for another time. But essentially what you have are the three Baltic states declaring their independence, using their legally enshrined right to remove themselves from the Soviet Union. That leads to an entire process by which the 15 republics then each declare their independence. And that's how you go from having a one Soviet Union to having now Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, all of these states, Belarus, Ukraine, emerging from it. Okay, so you've got that process of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Similar processes at stake in the dismantling of Yugoslavia. Again, Yugoslavia was a state that consisted of six autonomous republic, republics and two autonomous regions. All those six autonomous republics have become independent states. You'll recognize them. Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Croatia, so Slovenia, these are all states that have emerged from that particular process, but there were big questions around two autonomous regions. One of them was Vojvodina, which you may not have heard about because it's an ethnic Hungarian enclave in what is now Serbia, but the other you will have heard about, and that's Kosovo. So there are these arguments there about how it is that you can maintain an autonomous region. And all of a sudden, when you have these processes, federal states begin to feel a little bit uncomfortable because that, that's the Catalonia question. If you're a federal state, you already have a, a certain degree of self-government. Why should that self-government not involve you declaring that you want to be an independent state? What is to stop you? And very often what's to stop you is law and very often armies that stop you. But those are the kinds of elements that add that little tinge to it. The breakup of Czech Czechoslovakia it used to be a state. Essentially, it came to a conclusion that they wanted to go their separate ways. So you have now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. It's called the Velvet Divorce because it's about as, it was about as peaceful as you can hope for. So those were all so-called successful self-determinations. I want to end with some of the failures, um, maybe in the next five or six minutes, and then I'm happy to answer uh, questions. These were all instances where a claim was made for self-determination, but that claim somehow failed. I've put, put these 10 down, and there are more than 10 because many of them are multiple. I'm sure you have others that you, I would be happy to answer questions about. Katanga is one of the first and most classical ones on this one. So if you look at where Katanga is, it's in the, in the current DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's the mineral part of the DRC. It's the mineral rich part. Cobalt comes from Katanga. Uh, and by the way, that my organization currently has a new report on technology and its impact. And there's a piece specifically on Katanga and Cobalt. So Cobalt is removed from these areas in a conflict place and it ends up, and you might say, well, what's Cobalt got to do with me? You are, you're looking at a piece of Cobalt right now. It's in your computer screen, it's in your phones. Cobalt is quite key. But that piece of Cobalt that's extracted from Katanga 
has almost no value and almost no return to the people who are extracting it, but ends up being hugely valuable as it climbs up the food chain. Katangis have always tried to argue that they don't want to be part of the DRC. They want to be their separate state. And they made that argument in the 1950 and actually set up what is still one of the oldest UN peacekeeping operations, Monuk, which set up to try and make sure that, that, that there was peace maintained. But Katanga's argument to create self-determination failed and Katanga remains a sovereign part, a part of sovereign state of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Biafra 1971, and if you haven't read and if you like reading fiction, or if you, if you don't like reading fiction, I would still recommend you try and read this because I suspect at the end of it, you will start liking fiction. Half a Yellow Sun by, by Chimananda Ngochi Adichie. That name I have to spell. I hope I spelled it right. It's from memory. I do too many things from memory. Chimamanda's book, Half a Yellow Sun, which was her first novel, really captures the Biafra war perfectly well, gives you an insight. So if you take the story of Nigeria, I explained to you that there was, these were many different areas. I explained to you that the whole reason why Nigeria is separate from Niger is because Nigeria fell into the, into the British influence, which was different from the French influence. Nigeria was divided from Ghana by a border that separated the, the upper Volta uh, territorial dimension from the oil river state. This was all to do with how colonial sub boundaries were drawn and how colonial powers felt they could exercise power. That's the colonial story. The story from the perspective of Nigeria is that there were at least, if not more, there were at least three dominant groups in that area around those rivers. Oil rivers, because they are rich in oil, and that's where the question comes about Nigeria's oil as well. So this is also about resources. There were at least three groups there. There was a dominant, much more Muslim group, the Hausa Fulani in the north. There was the Yoruba group, much more in the south, who were, who were, much, who were better educated and much more aligned with British colonization. So much better educated in a, in a kind of modern British education, being able to speak English, being able to read these discussions way. And then there was the Biafrans who were in the east of the country around Port Harcourt. And they were somewhere in between the two. The Yoruba people became very much the kind of drivers of British colonial rule, but also became at the forefront of Nigerian decolonization. The Hausa in the north, the Muslim populations already had a bit of a tension there because you've got pastoralists in the north, you've got the clashing, they're Muslim pastoralists in the north because of the influence of the Ottoman Empire. Forgive me if this gets confusing, but if you look at a map, you will see that that northern part of Africa became Muslim as the Ottoman Empire spread. It didn't really get further down, it further down into, the, into that part. So there is that northern part of northern Africa, which is Muslim. The rest, there's Islam there, but not in the same level as you got in the north where it was much more homogenous. You also tend to have in the north more nomadic populations. So they move across more freely, certainly across the, across the, the Sahara in there, and that's where the Western Sahara case comes into. Um, and what you have also is a, is a fault line, if you like, between where Arab Muslim Africa meets so-called black Africa. And so you have this ethnic tension, you have a religious tension, you have a clashing of communities, but it's all captured in one state in Nigeria. Because essentially Nigeria is just declared as one. And so at the 1940 signing of the independence, there's something called the Aburi Accords. And the Aburi Accords, I will spell them out for you. For those of you who are interested in Nigeria. Uh, the Aburi Accords basically talk about Nigeria emerging that pays attention to all of the aspirations of the, of the communities. But in fact, what happens is it becomes dominant. And so there are at least three versions of what should Nigeria be. The Biafrans feel they are being treated as second class citizens. So they start trying to agitate. They have lots of, they have lots of discrimination, persistent discrimination against them. And they start trying to advocate that they should not be part of, of the rest of Nigeria. Of course, they are boosted by the fact that they also have access to oil because Port Harcourt and around that area has a lot of oil in it. So they are making the argument that essentially they should have a separate state. And for a while, 1969 to 1971, they kind of managed to hold their own. They managed to keep a territory that's defined. They managed to have an effective government of some kind or the other. They have a defined people. They don't quite have the relations with external. And for those of you who are familiar, I'm referring to the conditions of the Montevideo Convention I referred to before. They don't quite have the ability to enter into foreign relations, but that's coming. There's more and more support for it. 
the Nigerian army thinks, right, that's it. Dispatches the army, they win the war, Biafra is sovereign, part of the sovereign state of, America, of Nigeria. So you have a real contrast there between what happens in Biafra and what happens in Bangladesh, same year, by the way, 1971. The Saharan Arab Democratic Republic, around the same time, 1972, 1975 or so, uh, this is an area, again, if you look at a map, it's an area that's been drawn, straight line boundaries. You have Morocco to the north, you have uh, Mauritania to the east, uh, Mauritania to the south, and in between this area is the Western Sahara. What used to be in the Spanish colonization terms, the Rio del Oro and Saket el Hamra, two, two te territories. Why Spanish, you might ask? If you look across where that is on the map, you'll see it's opposite the Canary Islands. The Spanish kept going to the Canary Islands, and every time they went there, their ships were being hijacked. And so they thought, to hell with it, I'm going to take control of this area. So they claimed the coast. And if you remember what I said to you about the Berlin West Africa conference, you know, the buy one, get 10 free argument. If you claim the coast, the interior is yours. So they do some deals between 1910 and 1912, and they draw those boundaries with France, which designate what is Spanish territory from French territory, of course, French being Morocco and Mauritania. 1975, you've, you, you, you have this pressure now on European states to decolonize. Already you've got Portugal making the arguments and failing. So the Spanish are really, in a sense, forced to, to leave the territory. But of course, the question becomes, what happens to territory then? Morocco says, alhamdulillah, this is my territory. I'm taking it back. Mauritania says, no, no, no. This should be my territory. Around that time also, they begin to discover phosphates. And so that becomes a bit of a clash between how to do it. So there's a, a couple of things happen. One, the Spanish decide to do a census. So they say, right, we, we, the answer is really simple. We have to ask the people what the people want. Now, how do you do that in a nomadic area? How do you do that in an area where people come and go? But there's a census there. The census has around 75,000 people in it. So the answer becomes very simple. Just ask the 75,000. But there's problems with this. How many of the 75,000 were actually claiming that area? Maybe some were Moroccan tribes just passing through. Maybe there were genuine Sahrawi tribes who were away in the, in the eastern part of the desert. How do you know who they are? That's one question. A question goes to the International Court of Justice in 1975 for an advisory opinion, asking two questions. One, what was the status of that area in 1884? 1884 being the key time at which, the, as, at which colonization, the scramble for Africa is meant to have started. First question. Second question, what were the ties between that territory and the Sharifian state? Sharifian state, by the way, is the precursor state to Morocco. And under the Sharifian state, the Sultan of the Sharifian state and the Sultan of the Sharifian state used to hold court. It's not like a modern state. The, the Sharifian state, the court used to move to the imperial cities of Fez, Meknesh, uh, Marrakesh. And basically he used to hold court there and various, uh, various communities came and paid tribute. And the king, the Moroccan used that argument as saying they paid tribute to me, therefore I am the sovereign ruler. Under Islam, they were right, they were, the claim was better justified because the, the, the Sultan was seen as a spiritual authority over the entire Maghreb, which means the West. But does that mean that they had, he had the, the temporal right? That's a different question. So quite complex questions. In any case, the, the judgment in 1975, and that's something you can see on the website of the International Court of Justice, really says the territory was, was terra nullius at the time, and it had relations with the Sharifian state. Morocco says, alhamdulillah, this is, this is, a, this is proof that we own the territory. They give tax incentives, 200,000 Moroccans march, it's called the Green March, into the Western Sahara where they currently are. So now the question becomes, okay, so if you do a referendum, who are you gonna ask? Uh, the UN, by the way, says, this is a really simple question. We'll just ask people. In 1991, there's a bit of a ceasefire negotiated between the Polisario, the student movement, advocating for Sahara independence and the Moroccan state. And the UN says, we're gonna hold a referendum. 1991, they pass a resolution. If you read the tone of the resolution, it some, says something like, okay, we're just gonna go there, right? And we're gonna ask these people We'll write the answers down. We'll be back on Monday. They're still there. They haven't figured out who are the people who should be allowed to vote in the referendum to decide what should happen to the Western Sahara. Because these, these populations have mixed. They're the offspring now. If you think about it, if you, move, if you moved in 1975 to that area and you had a child, that child is nearly 50. So there's been generations now. Who has a claim? So it's become very complicated to the Saharan Republic. 
Very quickly, the, the next 6.4 are all states in India. Many of these were independent entities before the British arrived. Many of these were put into a state. They currently, their status, each of those is they are recognized as being independent entities within the federal system of India. India is a federal system. And all of those, those states, the boundaries have been redrawn based on language. So language in, in Assam, it's Assamese who speak, who decided what the language would be. So they designed a, an area around it. Big question in Assam, contemporary question. And this is a question that is high up on the list of my current work, which is that there is a threat that 1.9 million people may end up being stateless as a consequence of the Modi government's decision to enforce something called a national register of citizens, where they are basically saying these populations have arrived. It's true, by the way, some arrived from Bangladesh in the 1971 war. It is true also that other populations simply came over the border and started living there. But the fact is that so now the argument is that these populations are all foreign. It's intriguing. Because who, who drew those boundaries? The British did. So who decided who's foreign and who's not foreign? But that's a big, big unfolding issue at the moment. And it started off with Assam, but it's raising lots of questions across India. And this is why there has been a series of protests, which of course came to a hold on, on with the COVID uh, crisis. But I'm happy to answer questions with that. Because it asks real questions about the legitimacy of all of these states. I mean, Punjab is very different, by the way, from Assam. Punjab also, like Bengal, is a divided state. There used to be Punjab, used to be on both sides of the India-Pakistan border. They speak Punjabi also in Pakistan, and they speak Punjabi also in India, but Punjab is divided between Punjab that's part of Pakistan and Punjab that's part of India, lines on maps. Bengal is divided between West Bengal in the state of India, which is south of Assam, and Bengal that's actually now Bangladesh. You see this also, by the way, in China. Mongolia is a state in China, but in a Mongo uh, Mongolia is a sovereign state, but in a Mongolia is a state, a, a federal state in China. So there are all of these questions there. I'm going to just to take, jump from 6.4 to, to uh, 6.8 because I raised China. Xinjiang, Tibet, in a Mongolia, they are currently three out of six autonomous regions in the People's Republic of China. So there's already acknowledgement in the People's Republic of China that China is a family of nations. And there's very much this idea in the foundation of the Chinese state that the Han Chinese, the 93% of the Chinese are considered to be Han, H-A-N, that those Chinese have to sp spend a spirit of brotherhood, as it's called. Uh, obviously, no feminists were involved in designing it. Uh, a spirit of brotherhood with other nations. And that's supposed to be the Chinese state. But under Xi Jinping, that has changed. And what you have now is a much more aggressive interpretation about what is China. I've got a piece, by the way, in the Chinese Journal of Comparative Law, if you're interested, I can send you the reference on it, that talks about the impact of all of this on, uh, on contemporary India and China, because it asks major questions about self-determination. Apologies, I'm just getting my other screen up so I can see where I was. So those are 6.4 and 6.8 India, India and China. Sri Lanka, similar questions. There's been a civil war, as you may know, and the civil war was won in, in, independent, in, in, in straightforward terms by the Sri Lankan army, and this claims for a separatist Tamililam state in the north disappeared. So again, there's, but there's, that, that doesn't mean that the aspiration has gone away. There's still a claim there. So that was a failed aspiration as well. The next one, 6.6, .6, are all that, are, are, well, Ingushetia, Dagestan, and Chechnya are all claims that are currently being made against the Russian Federation. Nagorno-Karabakh, if you're not following it, you should. It's a current live claim between really the question of Armenia and Azerbaijan. And big questions asked about how it is that one population, in this case, ethnic majority Armenian, can live as an enclave in another state, which is, um, which is Azerbaijan. Very intriguing questions. And finally, the, the questions about Palestine and, and Kosovo I've referenced. I've also mentioned West Papua before. Uh, those are relevant, Aceh, Ambon, West Papua. They are all states or all entities within Indonesia. Indonesia is again one of these states that is spread over a huge geographical area, one of the 10 biggest countries in the world. Uh, but once Timor Leste got independence, many of these said, well, what about us? We are different too. We need independence. So I leave you with hopefully more questions than answers because that's the nature of this. But I hope you've enjoyed that and I'm happy to answer questions you might have. We still have, Elvira, I think about 14 minutes. Okay. Um... 
Um, I have a small question. Well, two actually. Yes, the please. first one is about the West Sahara case. Yeah. So, so just confirming. So in the beginning, Spain has invested millions into actually finding valuable resources and launching mines for phosphate extraction. And in the end, Morocco just ended claiming all of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an interesting question. When you say Spain invested millions in it, I mean, in a sense, the question would be what was the legitimacy of Spain to be there in the first place? Because that's the argument. You're right to ask that question the way you do, because, of course, that's also been the case in the Middle East, where you have in the Gulf, many of these Western, Western countries have oil companies that have invested millions, so to speak, in, 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 in extracting the oil. And then they've been nationalized. It's a question in public international law, the nationalization of oil wells. It came up in the, in the International Court of Justice with Iran. Um, it's a difficult question to answer in law because the question that underpins that is not how come Spain invested the money and lost the money, but the question is how come Spain was there in the first place? What were the principles on which they were there in the first place? It's an intriguing question, but yes, the short answer is it's considered legitimate for Spain to have lost uh, I don't know about the millions that were invested. As far as, as, far as I know, there it wasn't quite that level of uh, engagement because the Spanish investment was mainly in maintaining security on the border of that area opposite Canary Islands between Rio del Oro and Saquet Alhambra. As far as I know, there wasn't quite the level of investment that, say, the British um, Anglo-American oil companies put in, in places like Dubai and others uh, to, to invest in the oil. But in terms of public international law, self-determination, when you make the claim for self-determination, and I reference Article 1.3 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights I mentioned, Articles 1.2 and 1.3 of, um, of the Joint Article 1 says very clearly that it extends to resource rights. So you lose your resource rights, absolutely correct. Uh, you, I, get, I get the impression from your question that, that you don't find that very satisfying, but please go on. No, no, everything makes sense, thank you. Also, I wanted to know that, uh, do you think that actually this concept of self-determination has mostly been, had more, more negative effects on the states or positive effects? Well, in, in other words, do you think being this small independent entity makes, has more pros or cons? It's a great question, Nicole, and it's a, it's a subject of a very, very big discussion. I'll try and give you, give you a short answer. Uh, in political science, we offer, you'll, you'll see reference to what's called the 5,200 argument. And the argument is that there are 5,000, it's, it's not, nobody's counted them, but that there's 5,000 different states, entities, peoples, tribes, etc., and there's roughly 200 states. So what do you do? Do you ensure that all the 5,000 have their own state? Uh, maybe if that's what you want, maybe that could happen. What would the cost be? So there's a worry about the fact that self-determination could be a continuously available process by which you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller entities. And where does it all stop? You know, then maybe you say, well, I'm sorry, I'm left-handed. I need to have a separate state. You're right-handed. You need to be in a different area. So there are, there's been that critique of self-determination. And certainly it's true that in many places, you can say that self-determination, when the entity has emerged, is probably going to be weaker than the entity that existed. Let me use a an example, we're currently living in Britain. I mean, Britain is part of a supranational state, was a part of a supranational state called the European Union. Britain has now elected in a referendum to come out of that supranational union. All of the logic around economics, around, social, so, around law, around finance will tell you that that's a decision that is absolutely baseless in terms of what should happen. But it's a, it's a political sentiment. So will Britain be weaker as a consequence? I think empirically, there's no doubt about it. But so in the, in the case of Britain and Brexit, Britain will be worse off as a consequence of Brexit because what you are seeing in a global economy are bigger and bigger trading nations emerging. China is trying with the, with the one belt, one road to gain greater emphasis. So you're getting all of those states. And if you haven't looked up OBOR, one belt, one road, that might be something you want to, to look up, one belt, one road, where China is trying to spread its influence, trying to get access to supply chains and markets. So you've got all of that happening on the one hand, you know, uh, India, China are playing this role. Russia has already played the role of trying to get greater and greater influence. And here you have little Britain saying, oh, we don't like sausages. We're going to break away from Germany. We're going to have our own car. So, you know, you can see the logic of it is a sentimental argument 
that is going to not necessarily be beneficial. At the same time, there are sentimental reasons that have given other states a, a justification to create their ethnic units. So it's a difficult question to answer. And that's why I say to you, it's a very, very, very big discussion. And a lot of the answer depends on who you ask. Um, I'll just leave you with the story. I was in New York when the Scottish referendum was happening. And of course, because I write about self-determination, I was a general assembly at something else. People said to me, oh, so you must be really disappointed that the Scots voted, uh, that the Scottish referendum failed and, and Scotland's part of Britain. And I said, well, you know, on an intellectual level, uh, yes, but on a practical level, I'm delighted the Scots haven't abandoned the rest of us in Britain because the Scots seem a lot more progressive. So I think a lot of it is perspective. Okay. Thank you. I Sorry. Also about, for example, this. All, for example, as you were saying, um, even if the state, like, for example, the state Russia is extremely big, and the government, I, I feel like government doesn't even actually able to control all of it fully. So maybe for some states, it it, does, it would even make sense to divide some of its parts for, so that the government could take a better control over it. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that, Nicole, that in a sense, you, you ask yourself, what is governance for? And I think, you know, this is a question that certainly in my current work, we ask ourselves a lot because at the very least, a government should be able to keep you safe, right? And coronavirus is a classic example where big states have proven not to be able to keep themselves safe. Let's look at the top, the list. I mean, smaller states, by the way, have also done shockingly badly. But essentially, there is that issue of to what extent is a government really able to govern vast, vast parts of territory? And so that it's, it's a legitimate question, but I don't think we're politically in a place yet. Um, one, of, one observation, if you'll permit me, is that one of the classic examples of the Europeanization of international law is the absolutely uncontested argument that sovereign states should be the basic unit. If you look, and some of you who are living in Dubai, the, the Emirates system might be an alternative. You may well have, and I'm not saying that that's the best governed state in the world. I'm making no comments on it at all. But essentially, there may well be this idea of a super federal state that could exist, that gives local autonomy in conjunction with states coming together in a union. This has been tried many times, by the way. And I would argue that the creation of customs unions like the European Union, like the African Union, like CARICOM, like ASEAN, like LATAM, like SADC, Southern African Development Corporation. These are all similar types of ideas where states cooperate on economic terms, but then might also govern themselves. Absolutely, you're right. There may be a combination and a better combination of a local autonomy regime in a federal state in consors consociational or in, in association with other entities that might give us a better governance outcome. The problem is this is all about the exercise of power. And the people who currently want to exercise the power are super keen not to lose their ability to exercise it exclusively. Okay, um, I don't want to uh, let the, leave the opportunity to thank Joshua. Um, I have known him and worked with him for a very long time, listened to him dozens of times, and I am still astonished by the amount of information, knowledge, it is overwhelming. Um, we are very privileged that he gave us his time to do this. A couple of years ago, we also had the disgrace that he left Middlesex as the dean of the School of Law. He's still a professor with us, but it was the gain of another organization where he's the executive director with these beautiful views that you might or might not see behind him of London, oh, yes. Minority Rights Group International. Um, because I cannot pay him with money for his time or with anything else, I wanted to at least share with you um, an appeal that his organization is involved with at the moment that has been supported by uh, Patterson James, who is another very inspiring figure. You may be familiar with him if you have seen the TV series Notes and Crosses. You haven't seen it, please do. And um, we have an appeal at the moment that's led by Minority Rights Group International that you can donate to, you can listen to stories, you can engage with indigenous peoples, stories and to listen to them, which probably is one thing we don't do enough is to listen. Um, so 
I wanted to share this with you. Feel absolutely free, please do. It's the only way I can pay Joshua back to disseminate this appeal and to support it if you can. I will just uh, now copy paste the link myself here so you can look at it yourself and your own time. Thank you very, very, very much again for being here. It was a great lecture as always. Elvira, it was a pleasure. Just, just to say to you, um, by all means do, I, I see some of you asking for, for more information. There's the, the Princeton link I put up right at the start of that chat. This is an all day session at Princeton University, which brings together so-called experts on self-determination of which I'm, I'm supposed to be one. And that looks at 75 years of self-determination. There's also a session I'm doing uh, well, I'm doing something tonight on neo-colonial fashion or something like that at Cambridge. If anybody's interested, uh, you will, you'll see, you can find out about these if you follow me on Twitter at Josh Castellino. And there's one tomorrow with the special report on, on cultural expression with the former president of, of Ireland, Mary Robinson, also the former high commissioner, which is about uh, self-determination of a different kind. And that's the, the work we're currently in, engaged in, which is looking at how indigenous communities in the DRC the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have a case pending at the African Court of Human Rights, can actually gain access to their own territory. Uh, just before I spoke to you, I was on a call with uh, indigenous Kenyans in the Mao Forest in Kenya, where we won a case in 2017 at the African Court, which gives the indigenous community their rights. But exactly at this point, at five, five to 10, we were negotiating with them because the government is trying to buy off some of the Kenyans with uh, five, five hectare gifts. So if you are interested in any of this, yeah, please do follow us, follow me at, 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 um, at Twitter as Elvira has put down, but also Minority Rights Group. Um, and you will have my email address in any case. Uh, I wish you luck. I thank Elvira for the opportunity to, to do this. I, I love teaching, hopefully you get that, <laughs> hopefully you get that idea from, uh, from the way I deliver this. I, I love teaching, so I'm happy to engage with you on any questions you might have and good luck with the future. It's a tough time to be doing a master's program. You have my empathy and certainly if we can help in any shape or form on your journey from here on, please don't hesitate to get in touch.